Oh, welcome. I'm uh, Michael Vlahos. Welcome to Aegon. Uh, if you want to know more about me, there is an extended introduction uh, in the uh, video I've done with uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor. But I'm honored and happy to be here today with uh, Klaus Rien, who is a professor and founding director of the Center for the Study of Statesmanship at the Catholic University of America. He is also a founder of the Academy of Philosophy and Letters. Uh, we are here to talk about his new book, just out, entitled The Failure of American Conservatism and the Road Not Taken, which is the point of departure for our conversation today. Now, uh, Klaus, you cite in um, the book, which is a both a compendium of, of your writings for the past 20 years, but also with a lot of new material that stitches it all together. And in uh, a piece entitled Conservatives in Denial, uh, the dominance of the new church, I, I've called it the Church of Woke, uh, Lenin termed um, the vibrant uh, uh, sort of uh, entity uh, uh, of Bolshevism as the commanding heights. And you say this regime, including leaders in many or most of the churches, uh, is hostile to the old Western view of man and society. And in another piece, uh, Power Without Limits, I think you rightly attack the consequences of a childlike enlightenment and, and what, how, what it is wrought on our world today, you say, um, Rousseau, Rousseauistic idealists have had much success in overturning the ancient civilization of the West, but they have not rid society of egotism, greed, or the will to power. They have only managed greatly to weaken the old moral, intellectual, cultural, and political restraints placed upon them. The most telling illustration of America's fraught condition is the inability or refusal of our dominant trendsetting elites to recognize and act on reality. That, that sums up, I think, uh, the heart of the crisis that our nation is in now. And it is um, in many ways a crisis, not simply in, in the political realm of political factions at war with one another, it is uh, even, even more deeply a, a, a civilizational conflict in which the um, coherent vision of society is broken apart into different warring visions of uh, how we should live, what we should believe, and indeed, in, in an almost existential way, the nature of reality itself. And it is in this milieu that what we think of as the compass of conservatism has failed. I mean, and you examine this in the book, um, and it is, I think, manifest to anyone, any um, sober and serious observer of the American scene today. And so I would start out with the uh, the question implicit in the title of your book, uh, uh, and that is, what is conservatism? And before we talk about how it has failed, we need to know what it actually is, because uh, it, it, it's like the famous uh, interrogation of the most recent Supreme Court justice when she was asked uh, in the hearings, uh, what is a woman? And she couldn't answer. And I think a lot of self-professed conservatives would have an equal challenge trying to answer that question. So I, I put it to you. Uh, well, that's an easy one. <laughs> um, I think I would put uh, the emphasis ultimately on conservatism being an attitude of humility. Mm -hmm. Humility, why? Because uh, humanity has discovered in its several thousand years of existence that um, life is very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. 
We may have a very strong intuition of what ought to be, but we have learned from experience that we had better not be too reliant on our own insights. Mm. And something that conservatives are quick to recognize is that we need help. We need help to get us out of our own provincialism, our own presentism, uh, and we need to be uh, guarding against arrogance, right. humility. The Greeks warned of hubris as the greatest danger to act and to believe that you're one of the gods. And of course, in Christianity, the cardinal sin is pride. Human beings are prone to justify their own egotistical yeah. desires uh, and forget the dangers that follow from that sort of an attitude, not reining in your self-indulgence. So the crux of human civilization has always been, is it going to be possible to check the lower impulses of human nature? Are we going to learn from the many mistakes that we have made previously? Now, that I would say is of the essence of any kind of meaningful conservatism, a sense of the limits, a sense of the complexities of human existence and of our being torn beings, torn at the very core of our being mm -hmm. between higher and lower potentialities. Well, this is uh, fascinating in the sense that most people who style themselves as conservatives think of conservatism either as a, a, a simple uh, uh, traditionalism hewing to um, conservative values, for example, or they think of it in terms of um, a political context uh, alone that emphasizes a kind of restraint, uh, practicality, and uh, limited uh, government power. Uh, it, it's unusual to think of conservatism as a sort of intellectual modesty, a kind of a sense of uh, one being aware of one's own limitations and uh, in, in full knowledge that as a person that you, your apprehension of reality is by definition limited. And uh, that understanding of conservatism is not uh, widespread. It is no. not, not, you know, it's not abroad. I mean, it, it, it's there because you are here. Yeah. But no, to be a conservative, according to many, yeah. Uh, you have to have the right principles. Mm -hmm. And how do you get the right principles? Right. Well, you listen to the right authority. And then you exercise what they like to call moral clarity. If there's right in the world, you do what is right and you fight evil. That's moral clarity. You don't hold back. You try to be as virtuous as possible. The problem with that point of view is, to repeat, that the world is mighty complex. Right. No side in any conflict has all right on its side. The, the difficulty here, and this is sort of a leitmotif, I believe, that will follow us through our conversation, is that uh, Americans have no trouble um, accepting um, the authority of principles uh, prima facie, as though this is an authority I believe in this, and that means I am right and virtuous. In other words, there is no inherent self-examination or awareness of the need for modesty, balance, and restraint in the American ethos. Americans well, are supremely <clears throat> confident of, uh, of Americans, their rightness. Americans <laughs> are no one thing. Right. I think we have to, uh, this is simplification, clearly, but we need to recognize that Americans used to be different. Today's Americans mm -hmm. are no longer Americans as George Washington right. was an American. Right. I, and let me clarify. Take the U.S. Constitution as an example. Did the framers believe in a higher good, in a common good? Mm -hmm. That's what American republicanism is all about. How do we uh, run 
uh, a sort of interference against the powers that will ultimately destroy society because of their sheer partisanship. How do we, pro how do we protect mm -hmm. against the majority faction, for example? How do we uh, protect, uh, protect against ravenous capitalists? They didn't use that language, of course, but they were focused on trying to restrain various groups so as to make impossible right. a, a kind of a tyranny. Right. Does this mean that they were merely emphasizing the negative? No. They did emphasize the negative because they knew human nature. Well, you have to yeah. check human nature, right. but they were concerned about checking the lower parts of human nature in order to make it possible for the better angels of our nature right, to come right. forward. And so they set up this elaborate system, yeah. which is designed to ride herd on the merely partisan, self-indulgent parts of the, of the community. They are, in other words, acting yeah. out of a sense of higher purpose, right. a higher good beyond the partisan interest. But to have a very strong sense of mm -hmm. that kind, to have genuine integrity, mm -hmm. is not the same as knowing what in specific complicated circumstances is the right course. Well, I think you've described well what the um, sort of orbit of thought uh, was among the founders. And, and the, the best example of it, I think, is uh, Washington's a very self-conscious, deliberate decision to resign as commander-in-chief uh, at, at the end of the war and not to pursue the path of power. And he did that uh, to lay down a marker that this is the sort of behavior that is expected of a leader, not the um, not yielding to the blandishments of power, not to be uh, taken over and possessed by, by ambition. That, now, th this was clearly uh, what guided the framers, especially Madison in developing the Constitution. But their sense of higher authority, their sense of what made the, the, the better angels, as it were, and what kept... Um, you know, the, the dross underfoot and, and leashed, was an authority that came from where? What is its source? How did they all, uh, with unsp in an unspoken way perhaps, uh, a a apprehend that they um, abided by, understood what this power was? What was the source of authority to the 18th century men who founded our nation as opposed to the source of authority in American society well, we can we can go, for example, to their writings, mm -hmm. Federalist Papers. Uh, we can go to various other documents, and we find out that although they did not make this uh, self-consciously clear right. to themselves, mm -hmm. they were standing solidly in a long-standing right. tradition. Right. The rights of Englishmen were taken for granted. Right. Uh, the common law was taken for granted. Right. You look at the Bill of Rights, for example, and it's almost, almost, not quite, an import of the old indeed, thing. Indeed, indeed. That is, they stood in the old classical and Christian tradition as channeled through right. British culture. Now, there were other ingredients yeah. um, that seeped into this. Um, the Scottish Enlightenment, for example, uh, during the founding period. but. The heart of the matter, uh, in response to your question, is that they, without making a systematic philosophy of this, understood that they were standing on the shoulder of giants and that they were aided in their understanding as to how you can create a better society, one that cares for the yeah. common good, yeah. by yeah. taking in the wisdom that had found its way into long-standing tradition. That did not mean that they thought that the, the classical uh, Western tradition was uniform. There are right. many tensions within it. But for them, without again thinking about these as the sources, the Bible right. was vividly present to them, right. and the classics were. To, uh, that is, um, the, the education of people at that time who wanted to become leaders has been described as classics, classics, 
and more classes. Right. You had to know Greek, for example, to get into Harvard or later the... Absolutely. Yeah. So that they were living in a universe that was informed by these impulses. And what does this have to do with higher values? Everything. In that we need help. We are limited as individuals. There are no omniscient human beings. We need to consult the judgment of the ages as a, a follower of Edmund Burke might say. So they, the tradition yeah. is not some sort of final word. It's an aid in articulating our groping awareness that there's a higher goal to be served. It's a collective and shared foundation that everyone knows and, and it does not need to be spoken. And it seems to me that over the course, not of just two and a half centuries, but mostly in the course of the last hundred years, that there's been a transformation away from the acknowledgement and understanding of what those sources of authority are. Not yes. only is it not shared, but it is not known. And the transformation that you suggest in your book is that there was a migration from this shared awareness of who we are and where we come from and where we are going to uh, a um, recitation of fixed principles, that the principles themselves define w w what is good and solely and good solely resides within them, and that these principles um, at their face are, are the authority itself. And, and the, you have one um, passage where you criticize conservative originalists. And you say, many defenders of the old American Constitution seem to think that all that would be needed in order to save the Constitution would be to persuade Americans of the correct interpretation of the framers' intent. These constitutionalists live in a world of abstractions, a dream, -like, a dream world of their own. Now, that, that's referring to conservatives. But it seems to me that a similar process has taken place in the liberal community so that um, the, the source of authority is not only no longer shared, but it is uh, become rigidly embedded in the code language of the Constitution and, and other things. I just wondered if you could reflect on that. Yeah, what is the core of constitutionalism? It's not what has been written down in some sort of document. Right. American constitutionalism lives or dies mm -hmm. with the people who either embody or move away from the spirit of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Constitution is embodied in the lives of individual human beings, senators, congressmen, citizens. Right. If these individuals have what I like to call the constitutional personality, they have a certain character. They have a certain sensibility. Right. They have a certain sense of right, a certain kind of integrity. And if that personality fades away as we forget yeah. America's traditions, then the Constitution uh, evaporates. This is what we're seeing to a very, very great extent. And another way of saying why or explaining why American constitutionalism is dying is that Americans are no longer Americans. Americans have become ideologues of a kind that caters right. to or flatters our own humanity. You are able to persuade yourself because you adhere to certain principles, very abstract principles, that you are supposed to be a missionary. You are supposed to rule others for their benefit. Now, the, that temperament is about as different as it could be from the temperament of the American framers. Let me illustrate very briefly. What is it that the, what kind of conduct is it that the Constitution is trying to promote? Compromise. Uh, keep down your partisanship. Right. Look for common ground. Listen to the minority, respect the majority, hold your peace while they are in charge, but always consider the fact that life is complex. You need to hear many different points of view. 
Now imagine translating that whole temperament into foreign policy. Right. What would result? Something radically different from what we're seeing today. Right. We would be paying attention to the minority, our opponents. Maybe they have something to say for, their, for yeah. themselves. Yeah. But it's the entire effort on the part of the framers was to try to keep down the sheer partisanship, the belligerence, the greed, and so on in our own humanity, so that, to repeat, our better angels might come to the fore. What we have now is something very different, a belief that our principles make, make us virtue. Others do not need to be listened to yeah. because we are wearing the white hats and they're wearing black hats. They're always wearing black hats and they do not deserve to be heard. Well, Moral clarity has yeah. to be enforced. So the temperament is the opposite right. of the old one. The old one was to hold arrogance, conceit, hubris in check because it's dangerous. Yeah. The yeah. current ideology of American exceptionalism feeds Flattery. The, the difficulty here is that um, there is, if not a, a schizophrenia or bipolarity, there are at least uh, inherent contradictions in the new America that, that was created at, in the end of the 18th century. So, for example, you have the, 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 the sort of restraint, balance, modesty, uh, uh, a sense of uh, a moral compass, but on the other hand, as we see on the, the back of every bill in our currency, uh, it says novus ordo seclorum, a new order for the ages. So there was no shortage of confidence and more to the point, absolute certainty that America represented in some ways that, that did not exist elsewhere in the world to the same extent, certainly, that we were the agents of God's will. You have that strain yeah. in America uh, early on. Because Manifest Destiny emerged quite yeah. early. Yeah, no, that's a strain yeah. of, of, of American culture. But on the whole, it was um, kept down uh, in the temperament of the frame. You take a figure like Thomas Jefferson. Right. He is really, despite his influence, he is not a representative figure of the framing generation. And to say nothing of a Thomas Paine, these are people who are more right, than right. flirting with what no, was to come. Adams and Madison primarily. And well, you can, you can find Hamilton. in some yeah. of the, those people uh, some of the strain to which you are drawing attention. Yeah. But I'm saying that the overwhelming tendency of, right. of the American constitutional temperament is to hold down arrogance, right. to temper very human temptations. Well, that's why I was raising Madison, for example. Yeah. But, but the, the thing that is sort of at the heart of what's happened and why we're in such trouble is somehow there has been this transformation. And, and you position that transformation in the social and cultural transformation of America especially in the last century. And it was always true. I know this was true for my, my father, who was Greek. My, uh, well, you've had this experience yourself, is that when immigrants traditionally came to America, you know, they took on this bedrock foundation of America. And they, they did not convert themselves into displaced Englishmen in North America, yeah. but they certainly took on that entire tradition. And you see that working strongly even into the 1950s, but that is no longer present. And what you have instead is an emphasis uh, on uh, the preservation and exaltation of all of the different sources of culture uh, from whence people came, and all the new immigrants now are encouraged to uh, maintain their own vision, their own identity, and that puts great pressure on what had been shared as a vision of America, because it begins to reside increasingly 
solely in the, the artifacts and instruments of original documents. And nothing is really shared in terms of spirit, as you've been describing, of, of the first Americans. Yeah, and what you're talking it, about greatly complicates uh, the life yeah. of the United States, surely. But at the same time, you have that element that you were drawing attention to before, is sort of a messianic mm -hmm, undertone. Mm -hmm. You have that being increasingly secularized right. and coming to the fore in a person like uh, Woodrow Wilson. Yes, indeed. And Woodrow Wilson um, brings into um, the open, as it were, and the progressive movement brings into the open something that previously had been kept sort of under control. And then comes in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the neoconservative version of all of this that puts a, uh, an imperial edge uh, on the whole right. movement that was present from the beginning, right. but which now becomes acute. And now we're all uh, virtuous Americans by virtue of our principles, and they have to be exported across the world. Well, the, you, you have a, a nice passage there that, that gets to this, and, and it, it, it's interesting. I want to shortly focus explicitly on the failure of conservatism, but it seems to me that, that the larger problem is one that resides at the heart both of American liberal progressivism and conservatism, and here's what you say. To be a good American did not require respect for, familiarity with, and cultivation of the cultural heritage that made American constitutionalism possible. All that was needed was adherence to America as uh, the idea. A historicist thinking regarding America helped prepare the way for the notion that, unlike other countries, America is not a historically evolved society with deep roots in a particular past, America, in contrast, is exceptional. It is founded on principles that make it a model for other countries. And I think part of this transformation um, is, is rooted in this um, metamorphosis of American society and culture itself. Mm -hmm. and that um, you have uh, the original sources of American uh, messianism um, gradually becoming the only uh, touchstone for America having any sense of, of unity and, and shared identity. In other words, it's, identity has moved from the, the, if you will, the common law roots of of uh, American ethos to a set of uh, kind of frozen principles. And I, I w wonder if you could... No, I agree with uh, uh, that picture. And it's always struck me as one interested in the history of the evolution of culture, right. that there's something frightfully provincial mm. about this view. Uh, now, the Jacobins, I mentioned them in the book, the Jacobins, the French Jacobins, and the New Jacobins. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jacobins were, of course, fully persuaded that the country that ought to be the missionary power in the world was France, the one that they happened to yes. rule. Yes. Um, and they did that in the belief that uh, traditional civilization needed to be overthrown, and of course, this impulse resulted in war all across Europe. Yeah. Now, the people running the, Amer uh, the United States or its foreign policy establishment are not interested in having Fr France do very much, but America clearly is cut out for the job. And what is the provincial element here? Well, doesn't it dawn on some of these people that it's sort of extraordinary that they would happen to be born just at the time and in just the society right, which right. has clearly been appointed by history to do this marvelous work? Yeah. Uh, have they no familiarity with alternative civilizations? Have they no familiarity with uh, Homer and uh, the, the whole entire classical heritage. It's as if they are completely self-enclosed. And I think 
it's very, it's very clear among some of the intellectuals constituting so-called conservatism that they don't want to hear any about any other ideas. They need obviously constant reinforcement. They sense in a part of themselves that they are provincial, not very sophisticated, right, right. but they keep reinforcing each other and right. heaping scorn on those others who don't understand. Well, a universalist vision will be inherently provincial because in its assurance of universalism, it means that it need not consider and indeed should discard and better yet convert others to be just as provincial as you <laughs> yeah. in terms of the universal ideas, precepts, principles that yeah. you uh, espouse. And th this was not true of the founders, obviously. No. And yet it, it, it gradually um, entangled itself in the American consciousness. It's remarkable, for example, that Woodrow Wilson, uh, in his 14 points, would, would have not uh, a thought of, of what was going on within the traditions and the, 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 the myths and, and the larger, you know, swirling pot of, of European culture, but simply from on high deliver in 14 steps, you know, what, how the world should be remade. And, and it, it, this gets to the whole idea that, you know, God would speak through him and he could become the instrument of the divine. And th this had emerged in his person by the early 20th century, there was some uh, prefiguration of it in Theodore Roosevelt, but he was still restrained. But in Wilson, there was no restraint. And it, it strikes me that, that this process has been an evolutionary one. In other words, the, the current Church of Woke did not spring full blown from the head of Washington, as it were, like Greek mythology. It, it, it is part of uh, an embedded American uh, tradition, and as you're describing it, a kind of evolutionary or devolutionary process in which America has thrown off the traditions that were essential to its very founding. This could keep us busy for a very long time, but since you're bringing up woke, woke is nothing new. Right. Of course, it puts a twist on something very old. The first person to wish to, um, the first major figure in the West to wish to cancel culture right. was, of course, Rousseau. Yes. Right. He well, wanted to um, uh, uh, drain uh, reality of whatever preceded his great discovery. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, many conservatives have a very short range view of when things started to go downhill. They would say, uh, well, we had a tough scrape in the 1960s and early 70s. We had the new left and the counterculture, but we came back to health and um, we've been doing better since then. But those particular um, manifestations of revolt or liberationism yes, yes. were merely manifestations of something that has been working its way through Western culture for a very long time, so that woke and cancel culture right. was something that was easily foreseeable by anybody mm -hmm. paying mm -hmm. attention to the long run uh, terms in, uh, right. or developments in Western civilization. Well, in terms of your book, which is focused on the failure of conservatism, what's extremely troubling, but also very interesting, if not fascinating, is how um, these sort of um, unbending, simplistic, Jacobin principles worked their way into conservatism. Yeah. You, you did a nice um, piece called Neo Jacobin in Chief, uh, writing about uh, George President w. George. Bush. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, the President of the United States is no conservative, you write. He is a Jacobin nationalist. Inspired, guided, and supported by the ubiquitous neoconservatives, President Bush has adopted and fostered an ideologically charged missionary spirit that bears a striking resemblance to that of the Jacobins who led the French Revolution. The principles of freedom and democracy, quote unquote, are to be promoted around the world by virtuous American power. 
What, what strikes me as interesting, and just to note that the neoconservatives call themselves conservatives and they've now completely abandoned conservatism and have gone in with the next you know, uh, opportunity to, to gain power with, uh, with blue, uh, it, it's remarkable that conservatism was so infected by the visions that have their source, you, you mentioned Rousseau, but certainly their efflorescence in the Jacobins of the French Revolution. Yeah, and this uh, gets to another major theme in my book, mm -hmm. which is that uh, for all of its many strengths, great strengths in some respects, American conservatism never developed a really mature philosophical culture. Well, you said that it, it made huge strides and that a tremendous um, rich um, development in the 1950s and early 60s. Well, the start was very promising. Yeah. <clears throat> but things happened that we can go into detail on. But the sum total of what I'm saying there is that if America, American conservatism, had acquired a sophisticated, right. mature philosophical culture, it would not have had any difficulty recognizing who the neoconservatives were, right, or recognizing right, right. Uh, the anti-historicism of the followers of Leo Strauss for what it was. Well, let, let's, let's talk here, and, and this was another uh, you know, very redolent piece in, in the book. It was um, ideology versus philosophy. And I think that gets to a, a key um, point of meditation as to why all this has happened because clearly you see a difference between ideology and philosophy and I, I'm wondering if you would, I, I think this is a kind of key to why conservatism failed and why that uh, promising movement toward um, a, a rich belief system did not take root and I'm wondering if you could explain the difference. Well, let's get see. back to where we started. You pressed me on what is this here conservatism. And right. I, I, I associated it with humility. Right. Life is pretty darn hard to understand. Humanity has been working on this. And why is it so hard to understand? Well, I'm repeating myself. It's complex. And right. many have offered opinions. Weighty figures have offered opinions. And so you have to struggle in order really to make sense of the world. So the philosophic mind is one the philosophic, that engages in that struggle. Yes, the philosophic okay. mind keeps discovering the reductionism of yes. people who are quick to draw yes. conclusions. The, they're simplifying everything, putting everything in black and white terms, uh, putting everything in neat categories. The philosophical mind right. is aware of the fact that things aren't that simple. That doesn't mean that everything is a flux. Humanity has made great progress finding out what sort of life this is. There's a human condition, we might, right. we might say. We're still struggling, though, and, oh, and oh. We're still, we are still, in particular, struggling yeah. with the issue of how to create a better existence for humanity. Right, but, but philosophy is not something that is done in America today. It's not, it doesn't well, exist within the elites in any sense. It's, it's now almost banished. It's not completely banished because you're still there. <laughs> Here, but the uh, it, it it's pretty much gone from civil discourse, especially at the leadership and elite levels, and it in place is ideology. Now people really don't understand ideology uh, uh, as um, uh, something in contrast to um, philosophy, and yet. Um, it's often used, or was originally used, um, in, in relation to the um, political movements of the 1930s, the Nazis and then you know, the Bolsheviks as they developed in the Soviet Union. But there, there is an embrace of, of all of the forms and um, uh, ways of thought and, and action that are embedded in the commandments of an ideology. Well, most people like to have things simple. Right. And they want the principles to be such that they advance 
what they see as a desirable development for right, themselves. Right. That is, they may have a strong will to power. Let's take that as an example. The framers knew all about the will to power. Now, if you have a strong will to power and you want to, um, you want to lord it over other people, are you, going to are you going to announce to those others, hey, I want to rule you, right. shape up? No, you're going to try to win their favor by offering them something, maybe a beautiful vision of the world transformed. So one of the sources of ideology, not philosophy, is to conjure up intellectual structures that in effect clothe the will to power yeah. in, in acceptable uh, dross. Uh, in other words, there's a powerful inclination in all of us to cut off thinking when it starts questioning our own innermost right. dreams. And so we will listen to argument as long as it seems to buttress our own right. view, and we will close down when the philosophical mind says, yeah, but it isn't really that simple. Well, well this is important in terms of the long lineage of America, you know, as you posited quite properly, going back to the Magna Carta, uh, but also deep into the sources of, of Christian tradition. And it, it's interesting that the, the same kind of tension that you describe um, between philosophy and ideology was present throughout the development of the Christian tradition. And once Christianity became, um, was, I have to use this modern term, appropriated by the Roman elite, the issues of power and ideology became um, front and center in the church, and yet, arguably, the church preserved philosophy uh, in the form of interpretation. And this was carried on even more vigorously uh, after the Protestant uh, Reformation. And so there was always this tension between philosophy and ideology, or theology, uh, up, up to the Enlightenment, and uh, uh, literally up to today. And the problem is that Americans don't seem to understand what philosophy is. I, I think that in the Christian tradition, philosophy was well understood, and you had great philosophers from Augustine all the way up to um, the, the present day. And, uh, and yet Americans assume that in their ways of thinking, they are being philosophical. So for example, in the Church of Woke, they believe that they have a philosophy and, in other words, philosophy is used as um, interpretation or meditation or rumination, not in the sense that, that you present it as demanding uh, self-awareness, self-consciousness and re-examination at the deepest level. That is not on the table and I'm, I'm just curious um, how conservatism could have reached a point where it is, in many respects, in all of its different little yeah. subcultures, an ideological exercise now. They are well, not philosophical at all. I think a partial explanation is that American thinking has been, in general, resistant to what I call, in some, the historical consciousness. Yes, now, yes. what is the historical consciousness? It's integral to conservatism, to return to your original question. What is that? It's to recognize that the present moment had to be preceded by an infinite number mm -hmm. of other mm -hmm. moments. Right. That is, everything good that now exists was in effect prepared right. Right. for us. Ancestors come into the picture. Now, this discovery of history Yes, you might say, another way of speaking about the discovery of the utter complexity of yeah. human existence. Yeah. How an infinite number of things went into the making of the present moment. So that if you want to figure out who you are as a person, mm -hmm. you have an endless task. 
It's not just that you have to try to figure out who your father was right, or, right. or your family ancestors were. You have to figure out why they thought the way they did. And before you know it, you have launched a search that extends back and back and back in history. That's the historical consciousness. Right. Now, if you are predisposed to thinking of life that way, then you have the historical consciousness. Right. If you are predisposed to looking away from that, as Leo Strauss recommends, right. you tend to become an ideologue, not to see the utter complexity of human existence. So you're really describing a situation that, that would have attained in the past in um, the radical firebrand days of the Reformation, for example, or the height of the Inquisition, in which interpretation and the philosophic sensibility is all but shut down. And what fascinates me is not just the way in which Americans founding this country were imbued with a philosophical tradition. And not only that it was slowly, it slowly withered away, but that there emerged such a powerful claim of ideology. And it could be competing ideologies, fighting each other. That was certainly true in the period before the American Civil War, certainly true today. But the fact is that America is, is wholly ideology driven. And even though there are at least five separate identifiable species of conservative, you know, in the sort of popular mind, the paleocon, neocon, uh, uh, you have the uh, corporate traditional, you know, Republicans from the progressive era, and then of course you have the neo-populists and the paleocons. So and they all, have their, they all have their pet solutions. Yes. And they never absolutely. change, no. regardless of how uh, society changes, right. they stick to it. So if there are problems with the economy, uh, a certain kind of libertarian will say, well, we need to deregulate. Yes, and, yes. And, um, uh, well, someone will say, I'm a Burkean, for example, but they have they read Burke? And do they know anything about do 18th century Do they really know England? something about the historical <laughs> consciousness? Right. No, but Edmund Burke conjures up something reassuring yes, to many indeed, people, indeed. and so you can sneak in yeah. your own material. Right. So in general, ideology closes the mind right, down. Right, it stops right, right. reflection. It refuses to take into account how truly complicated life is. Right. I agree. I mean, the, the problem here, though, is not simply one of, of, of definitions. What is philosophy? What is ideology? It's understanding more deeply um, the sensibility of philosophy as opposed to dogmatism and orthodoxy. Yeah. And, and Americans aren't they don't know that. I mean, I've talked to so many uh, politicians, leaders, people in power, and they have this, you know, it may be different, it may be uh, held by only a faction, but they, they, it's, it's the, the field of American thought is strewn with idée fixe. Yes, but at the same time, I don't want to leave the, um, the impression mm -hmm. that deep philosophizing, you know, on the part of a few guys, um, would set America right. right. Philosophy, I don't think, is the crux of the matter. I think the crux of the matter is character. Right. Morality and culture working in tandem is the necessary support for something like constitutionalism and the rule of law. Uh, philosophy is important when it comes to understanding what this is really all about. Yes. So for example, looking at the uh, tremendous problems facing the United States now, a first requirement is, to, is proper diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now who will be capable of diagnosing our situation? Certainly not the ideologues with their ready-made answers. You need to face historical reality and deal with it as it is. But few people are capable of not dreaming themselves away and coming up with fantastic solutions to problems. Right, right. Well, the, 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 the real problem today, and I, I think we should shift to the issue of really the big question, which is, okay, so conservatism has failed, but what is to be done? What do we do now? What's the road ahead? 
And part of, of the deeper problem is that, um, <laughs> here you, you say, and this is from a, a piece you wrote, uh, When Populism Becomes a Slur, yeah, you, you write, uh, this much is clear, we cannot turn to the representatives of the American regime for standards of responsibility. Indeed, given its egregious mismanagement of American society, a responsible observer might have no choice but to issue his own call to drain the swamp. Now you were writing uh, at a time when uh, another man was president, but the fact is that it is extremely difficult to bring people to uh, a, a kind of awareness, uh, let alone a consciousness, but just an awareness or apprehension that in fact they need to know. In fact, the opposite is occurring. All of the uh, educational um, processes are being dismantled. And I, I was just looking the other day, the number of students in, in universities who get a degree in the humanities has shriveled. And in history departments, it's down to almost nothing. Classical departments are folding right and left. Mm -hmm. So the, the inheritance is being stripped away. And I think, obviously, at this point, deliberately, given the, um, the ideology uh, of, of, of the woke world. And conservatives have been uh, un unwilling or incapable of, of really coming to a point of understanding that this is where the, um, the struggle is and, and where um, uh, it, the, the battle will be fought. And at, at this point, um, what I see in the conservative movement with all of its many little fissures and fractures is, is a simple fallback onto you know, bromides and uh, traditional, you know, uh, rallying cries and that have no inherent meaning or even appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so the, the, the major issue is how to reverse something which is not going to be changed on the basis of being in power for four years or, or changing policy for yeah. a brief period of time, yeah. but actually turning the whole culture around. Yeah. Now, turning the whole culture around is a matter for several generations. Yes. And so it won't, in a sense, address our current problems. Right, right. But I, I do think that in these historical circumstances, there is an even greater need today than uh, ever before. Right for imagination. Now there's a sloppy word and everybody keeps using it, but it's a big deal for me. That is to say, when a tradition has been ruptured, perhaps beyond repair, mm -hmm. then there is a need for a kind of reimagining of the civilizing purpose of humanity for which the conservatives seem to be not Prepared. Now, I want to repeat yeah. that American conservatism in the post-war era and forward have many, many achievements to be proud of. The, what is sad is that the odds they were up against were so high on, on the one side right. and their deficiencies were sufficiently serious for a failure perhaps to, be, to have been unavoidable. You can't put all the blame on the poor conservatives. No. They were trying to do almost the impossible. Right, and, and in fact, um, the larger issues that, that beset us are, are not of conservative doing. And, and therefore, um, but, but this does not absolve them of the very uh, deficiencies and, and, and self-acquired uh, deficiencies that describe conservatives today. Here you say, many supposedly intellectual conservatives seem to consider ideas and culture from afar, as it were, feeling no deep personal need or intimate connection with them. Some are in a way attached to the arts or even to philosophical speculation, but see no significant and immediate connection between these and the life of practice. Ideas and the arts are mainly pleasant diversions. 
Many others have only slight interest in philosophy and culture for their own sake. More or less consciously, they tend to assess either thought or imagination from the point of view of whether it advances or undermines the political cause they assume to be incontestable. And, and here, this is where the, the, the most woke and the most conservative share so much in common. They've all picked up this uh, notion that it's all about power, which is the opposite of what the founders understood. And mm -hmm. just as a thought, I, I wonder what you think of this. It, it strikes me as we've been talking that one of the reasons that philosophy survived, even in, in long eras that we think of as being uh, uh, totalitarian, you know, like the medieval period, for example, the philosophic uh, sensibility was encouraged. And um, in the earliest universities, theology was a pathway to philosophic thought. And the Greeks certainly understood this. When, when they had schools of rhetoric, it wasn't just learning how to make pleasant speeches or write poetry. It was a, a philosophic sensibility that was taught by the rhetors uh, in classical antiquity. And th that's kind of the, the approach to life and the world that our founders had. And, I mean, there was a reason that they learned Greek and Latin. There was a reason that they were given a philosophic inquiry through schools of divinity and theology. And, and this is exactly what is missing from our world. And I wonder how much can all of this be deconstructed uh, without losing it altogether? In other words, once it's gone, people won't even know what they don't know, nor will they care. They may even feel virtuous that they don't know things because those things are now tainted. So we're in a situation where not only are we not cultivating this, we're in danger of losing it altogether. Yeah, so we are in a state of almost total confusion. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, a great many people are offering false solutions. Right. Uh, feeling good about yourself, for example, by um, propping up uh, Ukraine in its, uh, in its war against the Russians. Uh, but there are all kinds of other solutions that come to mind. And so much of what we see around us, I think, is a manifestation of sheer, uh, sheer confusion yeah, yeah. and dreaminess. Uh, for example, among the Christians, there are many who are licking their wounds. They can see that we're going to hell. But um, we will then withdraw into the catacombs yeah, well, and lick our wounds there. That's Mr. And, Dreyer, for sure. Well, um, I think that somebody like Dreyer has many good things to say about mm -hmm. shoring up family mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, religious life, and so on. But there's also a very strong impulse not to have to deal with this terrible thing we I agree. have I agree. all around us. And, or, and then you have certain others who uh, dream, for example, of having a cler clerically dominated society. Oh, the integralists, in yeah. I mean, this is not serious. It's a, it's a sort of an abstract, almost platonic exercise. Let's dream up something that would be uh, desirable and wonderful. But it becomes, in the context in which we find ourselves, a mere distraction, uh, distraction from thinking about what we might concretely do to deal with these particular circumstances. Well, um, groups that have been dominant in society that have not only lost their dominance but are threatened with being slowly and deliberately expunged will not only rush to, but cling to nostalgia and to the thought that there is somewhere a refuge, a sanctuary, yeah. uh, and that it won't all go away. And it, it's a kind of, um, it, it's a, 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 a fatalistic desperation. And I see this among many uh, who, who still long for a society that cannot be uh, reclaimed, uh, at least not within the next generation or two. It would be the work of several generations. But this, this brings me back then to uh, the, 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 the deep problem of what is an alternative course that could 
begin to halt the unraveling of everything, which is what I think we're seeing now, the unraveling of the most basic elements of, of humanity right in front of our eyes. And it's happened in, 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 in the last 10 years. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if, if you have um, a, a kind of way ahead. Um, you, you do offer a, a portrait of what's missing. You say, a stronger historical consciousness and a proportionally better immunity against moral political utopianism, which is the dreaminess, would have made conservatives resistant to imperialistic dreaming and adventurism. Strengths of this kind, as combined with more knowledge of the origins of American culture and constitutionalism in the classical Christian and English heritage, would have made them understand that American ordered liberty did not result from implementing abstract principles but from the long gestation of a particular culture. And, and yet what has been um, eradicated almost in our world today is the capacity to do exactly what you urge conservatives to do, or any American for that matter. It's, it's really hard to know uh, how to pick things up when they've collapsed. And I'll just give you one thing uh, as, as a concrete example. At the end of the Bronze Age, and the Bronze Age collapsed in an instant, in 1178 BC, and I, I, I know the guy who wrote that book, he's, Klein is his name, he's a terrific ar uh, archaeologist. And everything fell almost at once. And in Greece, in the Aegean world, writing itself was lost for almost 300 years. You know, Homer wasn't written originally, mm -hmm. and when it came back, it, it was the work of centuries. And I, I just worry that we, uh, for the first time since the Bronze Age, 3,000 years ago, we are facing a similar a kind of uh, uh, human unraveling. Mm -hmm. and, and I have no idea w w what can be done. And I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts. I don't think anybody knows exactly what could be done, but there's one requirement. I keep returning to this. We have to try to instill in other people, as far as it's um, still possible, uh, a radical realism. Right. Exploding illusions, wherever they are. We have to take them seriously in a sense, but in another sense, they're contemptible. And what we need to, to do is to rid ourselves, insofar as it's possible, yeah. of these illusions. Right. Uh, just exactly what that will mean in terms of practical action, I don't know. I can see in, in America, for example, the opportunity that the system of federalism, whatever remains of it, yeah. offers. There's a reassertion yeah, yeah. of federalism creating a breathing space yeah. uh, to resist the forces of, of destruction. Let's let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, kind of thing. okay. Uh, but <laughs> no, I but what, what, what is most needed is ruthless diagnosis of where we are. Let's stop dreaming and, concentr and uh, concentrate right. on what steps, what kind of steps are necessary. What we're talking about is changing the mind and imagination of the American people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, just as you have a very different understanding of philosophy than, than most Americans, sadly, uh, you also have a very um, useful way of understanding realism that is, I think, different from the very uh, shallow and, 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 and common understanding of what realism is. I wonder if you could just describe that for a moment, because I think that would, that would help explain what it means well, to regain realism. I have to do it by uh, taking an example. Uh, there's a whole school of international relations theory that's yes. called realism, yes. and it has to do with balancing power, understanding the role of fear among states, etc., etc., etc. Now, that is not an implausible approach given the state of humanity, but mm -hmm. If you are going to really understand the world out there, yeah. you have to be able to get under the skin of your competitors. 
Right. You have to understand the Chinese and the Russians from within. You need to attend to the yeah. moral and cultural circumstances, yeah. the yeah. history of things. Yeah. You know, I, I hear reporting about uh, the Ukraine-Russia, uh, it's really an America-Russia uh, conflict, but I hear the reports and I am dumbfounded by yeah. the apparent lack of familiarity with basic historical facts. You know, what about Crimea? Where does it belong? Right. Is it Russian? Right. Is it right. something right. independent? People don't know the basics. So I would say if realism is to be to our advantage, and I believe that it has to be to our advantage, it has to be permeated by a kind of understanding that has been heretofore alien to it. Well, I mean, the, the same is true, uh, not simply uh, of, of culture, and the, the milieu of, of, of Ukraine uh, as a borderlands and its relations with Russia and the rest of Europe, but also people have no understanding of war and no sense of what they're being fed, a, a set of ridiculous propositions about the actual nature of the conflict itself. And, and this is why I asked you about realism, because people are not capable any longer of engaging uh, with actual reality and on their own going through a process of, of questioning and investigation to find out what that actual reality is. So what must we do? We have to attempt to explode the illusions. Yes. Get people out of dream world. People prefer to dwell in dream world right. because the real world, in the real world you face hard decisions right. and obstacles. Right. I, think, I think this is getting to the heart of the problem and sadly, again, maybe tragically, we have created all the props necessary to sustain the dream world with social media, with CGI, now with artificial intelligence and in the medical field with the capacity to pretend to transform a man into a woman and vice versa or to um, to have uh, exotic uh, uh, pregnancies so that men and women do not have to go through the trouble of g getting to know each other or, to, or even to be together ever. You have at such an existential level, the, the dream world is becoming a, a complete sort of um, um, uterus for Americans that they inhabit collectively and, and don't know what they don't know and don't care to know anything else. And this is, a, you, you, you focus on imagination quite rightly. What, what makes imagination work? It, it's the, the deep knowledge of the past. And that's why, say, Tolkien is so fantastic because he created a, an imaginary world, but he used all of the massive uh, knowledge that he had at his disposal to create an entirely new languages, to, to, to uh, infuse this, um, this uh, imagined world with all of the richness of actual myth and legends that he drew upon. Well, and, Edmund Burke uh, has this phrase, you're familiar with it, the moral imagination. <clears throat> and Irving Babbitt, uh, a great American thinker, yeah. he understood by the moral imagination that which teaches you what human nature is really like yes, and yes. points you toward what ultimately matters. Right. And the imagination is not something that we sometimes engage and sometimes not. We're living in the imagination all right. the time. I agree. It's the intuition uh, that forms the backdrop of everything that we do and think. Unfortunately, dream world in the bad sense mm -hmm threatens to permeate it all the time. And since the age of yeah. Rousseau and yeah. the lower forms of romanticism, we have lived in a world that is informed by a superficial and nasty idealism. Well, I, the do-gooder yeah. do uh, mentality that results in disaster all the time. Well, we saw this in the emergence of Nazism, which yes. is, was created almost entirely out of the uh, romantic fantasy sensibility of German romanticism. Yeah. 
Although I will want to stress yes. that there is bad and elevating imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's always the imagination that's in charge. Yeah. For good or ill, it's in charge. So the people who shape the imagination, they run the show in the long run. Okay. It's not the politicians. As long as there's been human culture, and so we're talking uh, several hundred thousand years, um, one can examine all the evidence we have of human culture, whether it's the remains of people who didn't yet know writing and could just paint on caves to, to the wonderful writings of, of antiquity and, and after. Knowing those allows you not only to, to, to better understand reality and thus be a, a true realist, it also mm -hmm. unlocks the imagination. That's yeah. why I mentioned Tolkien. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, m my greatest concern is that the entire edifice of in inculcating uh, that knowledge into a new generation is being dismantled. And I, I don't know how uh, that can be overturned. Now, I brought up the, the Greek Dark Ages, but something similar happened uh, in the West, the Latin West, after the fall of the Western Empire. And so all of the knowledge was saved in, in monasteries and preserved and then laboriously recopied and, and thus kept alive until it could be again accessed, and, um, which really began in the, in the 12th century, uh, in the Renaissance of the 12th century. And I, I just hate to see such long periods where humanity and human society and culture flatline for a period. Uh, at the same time, it's pretty clear that all over the Western world, um, the disgruntlement yes. is growing. Yes. People know yes. that something right. is radically wrong. And it's interesting to observe how the elites react. Mm -hmm. Do they recognize that maybe we did something wrong and that we ought to um, improve our right. ways and take their opinions into account? No, it's a double down. Yeah. on what has already caused the problems. But there is some, some hope in that people have a visceral sense of revulsion against what is being done to them. Right. And we never know what forces are stirring. Russell Kirk used to say when I talked to him uh, and asked him how he was doing, cheerfulness keeps breaking in. <laughs> You know, you, you, you look at uh, the terrible things, the catastrophic things that are happening, but then all of a sudden there is something that uh, perhaps prefigures the yes. change. Well, the cheerfulness uh, is certainly evident in, in the Jacobin example. I mean, that the, the, the bad period, you know, the, the, the little pit of the French Revolution only lasted about three years, mm. but it ended because elites were horrified. I mean, the, the, the elites that, that actually took over France, the bourgeoisie, most of them were horrified and they put an end to it. Right. And, and, and th that is the opposite today. Today, it's the, not the optimates, but the populares who are re re expressing revulsion. And yet, as we know, through history, and you had many slave revolts like Spartacus in antiquity, and you had rebellions like the, the Hussites, for example, in the 15th century, they were all savagely put down by the elites. And so that is, uh, I, I too want the cheerfulness to creep in, <laughs> but, but sometimes one must accept that there are these, there's this other dimension, these other narratives that, that uh, are kind of countervailing. Score. Well, I think um, some of them are outright diabolical. Yes, yes. The, the demonology is one of the most uh, startling aspects of, of the, the darkness that we are descending into in the sense that it, it, it reveals things that were once understood as truths mm -hmm. and are now being rediscovered again. So even in that darkness, there, there may be uh, glimmers of hope. Now the, Emphasis in my book is on the failure 
of American conservatism and on the road not taken, right. I might have written a book about the successes of conservatism because they were successes. You look at some of the figures who um, contributed in a significant way uh, to American right. conservatism, and you find uh, really admirable contributions to history, sociology, economics, but I could go on. Right. And the problem is that these contributions, for whatever reason, were never taking deep root yeah. so that they could be developed, mm -hmm. refined, extended, something about conservatism. And I would say it was the obsession, the preoccupation with practical politics diverted conservatism oh. into activism rather than profound rethinking and reinvigoration. Your, your call for more art and more poetry, too, was very affecting. I won't read the quote. I have it here. But yeah, but nobody reads poetry anymore. Right. But isn't po that the problem? But, but po <laughs> I use poet, poetry in the wide sense. Of course. That of course. Which appeals to the most refined sensibilities yes. of enlightened human beings. I think we'll, we'll leave it there because that, 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 to me, is cheerfulness creeping in. So, Clay, I want to thank you so much for It's been a pleasure.